Joining us at Post 9 is longtime Wall Street dealmaker and Apollo Global Management Senior Managing Director Gary Parr, who then at Lazard advised Bear Stearns on that sale to J.P. Morgan. He was also instrumental in the restructuring of both Lehman Brothers and the U.S. Treasury's restructuring of Fannie Mae, still in conservatorship. Also, I, if I remember, AIG, too, at least along the way. There's Gary, you were in a lot there of these. Um, but let's go back 10 years ago. Sort of take me to the room. You know, it's been a brutal week. Yes. Um, confidence is gone. You know kind of what's about to happen. And Jamie Dimon says what? <laughs> so there were two parts. One was, you're right, there was a panic. There was a run on the bank. There was a, a lack of financing and funding. Time was running out. When we came to that weekend, the final weekend, was J.P. Morgan uh, saying that the price they would pay was $2 a share. And I will never forget that phone call coming in. I was the one that took the call, stepping out of the boardroom and saying, I think I, we have a bad connection. Uh, can, can you say that again? And do you really mean it? And so it was $2. But you know, Bear Stearns had two choices uh, to make, $2 or bankruptcy. And it ended up being raised to $10, uh, fortunately. But uh, in the end, those were the two decisions. And I do believe still sitting today, 10 years later, the right decision was made. Indeed, in a sense, Lehman Brothers validated that. Right. I mean, it would seem that six months later, when we were then entering the depths of, or the real beginnings of the serious yep. crisis, it was, it was confirmed. How bad th were things at, at Bear? I mean, lessons learned here. You know, I was talking earlier about 220 billion of at-risk assets versus 11 billion in equity. It's not hard to understand how confidence might go away fairly quickly. Yeah, I was going to say it's all the characteristics we've seen in crises in the past, or even if you read the history books of, over centuries, and that is too much leverage, illiquid assets, and then your funding goes away. And, uh, you know, at that point in time, the other issue we all were thinking about that weekend was it really wasn't only Bear Stearns. It was the example. It was where fear was placed that weekend. But in reality, every other major investment bank had illiquid assets against short-term funding. Not that they were necessarily bad assets, but they couldn't liquidate them in a hurry. So we actually knew there was another issue, a broader issue everyone had. It just happened Bear Stearns was first. But there was a, a mix of, it was there something about their asset mix that made them first, right? It was. They had more mortgages uh, and therefore people assumed more uh, risk in the, you know, you'll, we'll all remember the mortgage problem. So that being the asset class that people were focused on. So yes, they had a higher proportion. So that brought the bright light first. As we sit here on the 10-year anniversary, um, there were movements to roll back a lot of the reforms that had been enacted in the in the wake of the financial crisis. Does any of it make you nervous? Or do you think that, the, that those risk factors simply don't exist in the system anymore and that banks are so well capitalized, the run on the bank situation, that bare face, it can't happen either? So I would never say the it can't happen um, because as long as you have short-term funding against other assets, it could. I would say that today, so far, the regulatory changes being discussed, I view as being targeted to the small banks and not of consequence where the real systemic issues are. So I'm not seeing that yet. And I would worry about it if that were beginning to happen. And I don't think, it's interesting, I don't think today we have the risk of what we had 10 years ago. I could sit and say there are other things I might worry about when I'm, uh, if I wanted to worry. But it's not the same thing. Usually things don't replay. You, you, you fix last year's battle or 10 years ago battle, and then you know, what next? Would you say the fix, to the degree it's been fixed in terms of risk strategy, mm -hmm. has come from within banks? Or was it something about legislation? If so, what was the most potent part of legislation? I would say it was probably a combination. Banks, never, they didn't want to relive this again, of course and legislation, uh, the very good parts of legislation targeted increased liquidity and increased capital. Just as Melissa said, that was what, that's the core of addressing the issue, and a lot of that was legislative, and the banks wanted to do it as well, so I'd say it was a combination. But that was a core issue. Gary, six months after Bear, of course, the government made a decision to let Lehman go bankrupt. Yeah. How much of what happened at Bear then informed that Probably not great decision, I mean, yeah, it's, probably, it, it's, but incredibly consequential decision to yes. let Lehman go. There, were, uh, there was a primary issue we were concerned about in Bayer, and that was that the technology, the systems, weren't sophisticated enough or fast enough to deal with all of the counterparty risk if there was a bankruptcy. 
uh, and that the in fact on the markets would not open in Japan the next on the Monday morning and so on around the world. There was this fear of the technology. So what the government focused on rightly was let's get all the tapes from all the investment banks, let's figure out how we would do netting, how we would do counterparty risk and fix the technology system so that if we ever face this again, we're ready on a technology front. There were some number of other things done too, but that in my mind was the big one. In the end, when Lehman went under, it really wasn't a technology issue that became the issue. It was a money market fund issue. You know, if well, you look systemic at the funding, risk so, and counter. It, it, and, exactly. Right. So it was something unanticipated. So I'd say at Bear, we had one particular thing in our minds. And at Lehman, most people thought that was addressed. Indeed, it probably was. But there was another risk that had not been properly anticipated. Well, then, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Melissa. Uh, you mentioned some of the other things that, that might cause you to worry if you wanted to worry. Let's say we wanted to worry. Yeah. What are some of those things? The primary thing I worry about is cyber, cyber security, cyber risk. And, you know, again, panics that are systemic arise from fear. And it's fear of I'm going to lose my money. What do I do? And everyone has the same reaction. And so I, I could, I suppose, paint a scenario, imagine one or more institutions in the U.S. were attacked in a cyber manner, that whatever it did, whether it was taking somebody's deposits or just disrupting the accounts, but if there was multiple attacks and people said, who's next and what does it mean for me? I don't want to have exposure to financial institutions. Imagine the run on the bank. The run on the that. banks. Yeah. Would, would, and, and, so I would sit today and say, I believe that's the one, because that's what you worry about systemically is where you don't know who's next, you don't, know, you don't even know how to analyze who's next, and out of fear, therefore, you pull your money. And, and, so that's the one that does concern me. And explains why banks are spending so much, so much. of their they, available they cash understand on tech. It. And I would like to think, I know the government spends a lot of time on it, because in the end, if that were to occur in that scenario, I think in the end there's only one entity that could address it to stabilize the system, and that would be the government. Again, I don't think it would be individual institutions. And Gary, back to the actual negotiations themselves. I yes. mean, what was the $2 based on, and how did you actually get them to 10 and was, you know, and clearly Treasury was involved in those conversations I, as well. So, so in the, how you, you, you'll recall, the stock had closed somewhere around 30 the prior Friday night. Yes. We had reasons to think maybe the, the price that would be offered would be uh, higher than two. Uh, when it was two, how they arrived at two, you'd have to ask them. I yeah. don't know the answer. I can only say we were disappointed, we didn't like it, but then we had to deal with reality. The moving it to 10 had to actually do with some very technical aspects of the uh, contract. It was put together quickly and it allowed us to say, actually to get shareholder approval and to get this done properly, 10 will work better to bring this all together. So we were able to raise it to 10. It was a five-fold increase. <laughs> yeah. it, yes, it seemed like I wish it were more. We, we yeah, can laugh something. at least a little bit now. Gary, well, thank you. Well, it is you. 10 years later. I let's know, not, and years. let's not relive it. I was going to say that was uh, And you still look great, books. Gary. Okay. Nice of you to as say. You, yeah. Likewise, David, I saw your video. You haven't changed <laughs> yeah, a bit. Yeah, right, so right. thank you. Actually, there's the one who has it. <laughs> you know, oh, my the, God. The master. Don't start. Uh, Gary, thank <laughs> you. Always a pleasure to see you. Gary to be here again. From Apollo. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.